God bless you on this Saturday. Those of you out there in Book Lang, I'm coming to you once again with a second part of the message concerning men walking in their authority. So the name of this message is called Men, It's Time to Walk in Your Authority. Again, the message is called Men, <clears throat> Excuse Me, It's Time to Walk in Your Authority. So let's go to the throne of God and pray. Prayer is important. So Father God, we thank you on this Saturday for your grace and your mercy. We pray that all words spoken would be all you and none of me. We pray that the Holy Ghost would destroy every yoke and remove every burden, that it would burn up all unrighteousness at the seed and at the root and anything connected to it. Father God, change us through this message, challenge us, strengthen others in comforting those that have lost loved ones and that are going through. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. I'm glad to come to you this morning on Saturday. Once again, I try to get on Facebook Live at least once or twice a month or every other month as I'm working on other projects. Be that as it may, we want to talk about men, it's time to walk in your authority. We see that in the world today, there's a lot of crime <clears throat> and it's the statistics on crime are going up and not down. And unfortunately, the responsibility lies on the body of Christ. I'll repeat that. The main reason why <clears throat> sin, darkness, and or crime is on the rise is because of men in the body of Christ who have not been walking in their authority like God told us to. I want to take my time today. So I'm going to have a foundation of scripture, and that is Psalms 144 and 1 out of the Good News Bible. It says, praise the Lord, my protector. Pay close attention to these words. He trains me for battle. He is my protector and defender, <clears throat> my shelter and savior, and whom I trust for safety. He, God, subdues the nations under me. I want to break this scripture down. I have a lot of notes, but I want to break this scripture down a little bit. Here we have David saying that, one, give God thanks. We all know that are born again. That's a righteous thing to thank God. But then he says, my protector. We've heard many messages about how men are responsible to provide for their families, and that's true in other areas. But this one area, beloved, has been neglected. And because of this neglect, the enemy has moved in, caused divorce, sexual abuse, and crime has risen in government and outside of politics. Here David says, God is my protector. You know what a protector is. It's someone that makes sure a person, place, and or thing, or group, or nation, or city, or state, or country is safe. They don't have to be concerned about no one sneaking up on them, no one threatening them uh, verbally without being held accountable. And then he says, he trains me. Training is discipline. He trains David for what? Battle meaning that there's going to be some uncomfortable situations that come upon at this time in David's life. And he said, God trains me for battle. Now, he's not talking about a spiritual battle because back then, the only ones that were really in tune with the spirit of God were the prophets and prophetesses. David's talking about physical warfare, combat strategies, learning how to plan, learning how to think and plan ahead. So he's talking about that as God is his protector, his defender. And then he says, my shelter, my savior. Now, the last verse is very interesting. The last part of the verse. He says, God subdues the nations under me. 
What does it mean to subdue a nation? It means to take control of their government, their economics, their food source, their water supply. It puts the subduer in perfect control of the economy and of that area. Total control. So there's no ability for the victims to retaliate. They're stripped of the authority. So you have to read the Bible with an Eastern mindset. There have been a lot of things that Western Eurocentric people have put inside doctrine that has caused fear, doubt, unbelief, confusion, deception, manipulation, and control, especially concerning black men and many Latino men as well. We're going to deal with that. We're going to look at the root of deception, that low self-esteem of turn the other cheek. Physically and verbally and psychologically. Where did that start? One, it started when Adam sinned. He gave his authority over to Satan. However, when Jesus died on the cross, shed his blood, he defeated death, hell, and the grave and ascended into heaven and is now the high priest for our salvation. Jesus removed that authority of the enemy and gave it back to the born again man. We'll deal with the unbeliever in a bit, but now we're dealing with the born again man because Jesus said, I am the light of the world and you are the light of the world. We are the men. So we're supposed to be leading and not allowing certain negatives to take place. So, we see that it started with Adam. He gave his authority to the devil. As I said, Jesus redeemed it back on the cross. And even though Jesus redeemed it back on the cross, the enemy used slavery to decrease black men's self-esteem, black men's worth, and women and children, but the men were the leaders. The men were raped in front of their families. They were beaten. They were tortured in front of their families. So that created fear in the women and the children to do anything the slave owner said. We have to deal with this because racism existed in the white church years ago. White pastors and ministers owned slaves and were raping them, beating them, and treating them wrong. They used the scripture. You're supposed to turn the other cheek located in Matthew 5, 38 and 39 as an excuse to beat them, rape them, oppress them, and take advantage over them year after year. Now, what does this do? This creates a psychological weakness in a man, how he values himself, how he sees others, how he sees the world. And that same belief system, beloved, has passed down from generation to generation to generation in the black culture as well as Latino. How did it pass down? It passed down through mainly preachers who were taught that turn the other cheek means let someone slap you and beat you to death and take physical advantage over you. Beloved, that is totally wrong. I've studied the Bible over 18 years. I've been to Israel. I study the culture of the Eastern world. That's where the Bible came from. It's an Eastern book, but we live in a Western world, a Eurocentric world. So what happened was the Vatican, Catholic institution, and others 
connived a scheme and said, well, we're going to use this scripture to oppress blacks and down the line Latinos as well. And that's why you see things like mostly white men on the police force. This thing is deep ingrained. So you have to realize that turn the other cheek is not a sanction for someone else to beat you black and blue, to spit on you and to disregard you as a human being and as a man. Turn the other cheek. The real meaning is in the East, if someone had a disagreement, the best way they would try to solve it first, notice I said first, was to try and verbally work it out. They would try to verbally talk through it. If that did not work and someone retaliated with physical harm, the other group responded, hopefully, with a stronger attack. That's why David said, Psalms 144, Praise the Lord, my protector. He trains me for battle and prepares me for war. He is my protector and defender and my shelter and savior in whom I trust for safety. He subdues nations under me. We're going to deal with that last part of that verse later on in the teaching where you're actually going to see something uh, eye-opening that's been in the Bible for years. However, black ministers who've been brainwashed with a Willie Lynch attitude, slave attitude, White ministers who claim they love everybody will take your tithes and offerings, but they won't give you a message like this. I'm talking about mega ministry, white ministers and black. I can name names, but I'm not. You know them because you watch them all the time. If you haven't heard a message like this through a mega ministry minister, you need to keep your money and do something else with it. I'll repeat that. If you have not heard a mega ministry minister teach what I'm teaching on, you need to take your money and do something else with it. There's only one minister that hit this really hard when he was alive, and that was Dr. Frederick Casey Price. He did a series and wrote three books on race, religion, and racism. Do you mean to tell me he was the only one God was talking to? No, he wasn't. He was the only one that obeyed. The Bible says that God speaks in diverse manners. He speaks in various ways. He speaks through different people, circumstances. So he had to be speaking to somebody else. The only one that took that assignment was Dr. Frederick Casey Price. Out of all the male ministers. So that's why it's time to walk in your authority. Let's move on. So I talked about the root of fear and deception. I talked about how the turn the other cheek came into the body of Christ and was, it was toxic and, and its total purpose is destruct, destructive. And what that does down the road, we're going to look at some things that men do down the road because of that false teaching. Beloved, Anytime you or I swallow a lie, it weakens us to walk in real truth and reality. I repeat that, hallelujah, Jesus. Anytime we believe a lie, it weakens us as human beings to walk in truth and righteousness and to discern what's the good, the bad, or the ugly in any situation. You have to realize that the devil was once in heaven. He's smarter than you. He's smarter than me. And that's why we lean on God for his wisdom to open up things like this teaching to help us men to walk in the authority that we're supposed to walk in. So we talked about the psychological damage of turning the other cheek. Now we want to see what else does the scripture say about being prepared for physical battle. We've dealt with spiritual battle all day long. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, blah, 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 blah. There are times you have to deal with things in the natural. Perfect example, when you're hungry and need to eat, 
You don't speak in tongues unless you're praying over the food. You eat food. When you're cold, you put on clothes. When you're dirty, you use water and soap and deodorant and lotion and things of that nature and cologne for the ladies' is perfume to put on your body. Physical. Some believers walk in osmosis. They're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. So here we go with some scriptures. S Hebrews 13 and 8 says, God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. We dealt with how he prepared David for battle out of David's mouth. He subdued nations under David. He wants to subdue nations under men. He wants to prepare us for not only spiritual battle, not only financial battle, but physical battle. Because if you're a homeowner, no fool and scumbag has the right to knock down your door. If you're getting gas at the gas station, no scumbag has a right to try to take the vehicle you work so hard for. So we're dealing with stuff that's happening right now today. And this is the reason why the black Muslims are winning our men to their side because they believe Psalms 144 wholeheartedly. So Hebrews 13 and 8, God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Now, we're going to talk about Abraham, Genesis 14 and 14. Lot was kidnapped. When Abraham heard about it, he took 318 trained soldiers, his elite army men, went and got Lot back. Question, when they attacked the enemy, do you think they pleaded or talked or said, okay, enemy, Lot, you got to realize we got to turn the other cheek, so you got to stay there. They didn't do that. They wiped them out. They dealt with them and dealt with them fiercely. They wiped them out. You have to have an Eastern mindset, men, which is militant. You have to have strategic thinking to be successful in any area of life, but especially when it comes to walking in your authority in Jesus. Because if you don't, you're not going to get at anything else. And that nine to five you got may not be the zenith or the maximized potential where God wants you anyway. I'll hit that for a minute. Do you know that Queen of Sheba, Queen of Ethiopia, gave King Solomon $5 million worth of goods. $5 million in today's economics. Job's net worth was, after his stuff was restored, a half billion dollars. Solomon's net worth economically was $2 trillion. So if you're walking in unbelief of turn the other cheek, it's going to affect you growing economically where God wants you to be. Not what the world has told you, not what your nine to five has told you, not what Pookie and him have told you, but what God said in Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14, to truly make you the head and not the tail. Hebrews says, I believe that eighth chapter, we have a better covenant based upon better promises. Question, if Queen of Ethiopia, Sheba, gave King Solomon $5 million worth of gifts, how much more did she have left? We're talking generational wealth. That's why it's good to walk in your authority. And it deals with the turn the other cheek issue because one thing affects the other. If Job's net worth was a half billion dollars, these are real statistics. They're not exaggerated. exaggerated. Half, a half billion dollars, where should the average born-again believer be as men, including myself? Where should we be economically? If King Solomon's net worth was $2 trillion, where should we be right now? 
Something to think about. Back to this here. In Genesis 19, verses 1 through 29, you will see God actually destroying Sodom and Gomorrah and three other cities because of what? Sin. He came to Abraham and said, uh, I can't find no righteous people in these cities. Homosexuality, lesbianism, you have lesbians uh, being ordained in churches. The government is threatening Holy Ghost filled preachers if you don't marry these people, that we're going to lock you up. All this crazy stuff because men and the body through the years and even today are not walking in the true authority of Jesus Christ. Let me get real right now. Just because you can quote some scripture doesn't mean you're walking in your authority. Just because you're filled with the Holy Ghost does not mean you're walking in your authority. Just because you go to church does not mean you're walking in your authority in Jesus. No more than somebody putting on a police uniform that has the right to stop traffic and to investigate a crime. Just because they have on the uniform doesn't mean they're a policeman. There are rapists and serial killers that do that. They don't have the authority to exercise the law sanctioned by the state or that country as a true policeman. All they have is the uniform, the outside looks. Paul said having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. This, is, this deals with that too. So in number 16 and 1, we see three tribes that came against Moses, which actually came against God. Korah, Dathan, and Abiel. Abiel. Those men were killed by God. He opened up the earth and swallowed them up. You better see God in a different light. I didn't say he spared them. I didn't say somebody prayed. He wiped them out. He got rid of them. The earth opened them up, opened up, swallowed them up. Them and their children and all that they owned, they died. This is why David said, God subdues nations under me. He's my protector. See, David knew this. And it stayed in his mind, even as a boy. That's why when the bear tried to get the sheep, David acted physically. Destroyed the sheep, destroyed the lion, and destroyed Goliath because he knew these. His belief system was different. I told you. It goes what you think, what you believe. So we got to get out of this Eurocentric Willie Lynch attitude, brothers. What else happened? Second Kings, the first chapter, verse 10, Elijah calls down fire from heaven and burns up two companies of 50 men who came to arrest him. I said the fire burned them up. The fire, he called fire from heaven. God sent that fire down and killed 100 men. When the third party came, this general was smart and pleaded for his life and he was safe. What else? Now in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 23 to 24, Elisha, Elijah's student, his mentor, his disciple, was minding his own business when some youth started ridiculing him, ridiculing him with the mouths, mocking him. Two she-bears came out of the woods and killed them. This is in your Bible. Again, this is why the Muslims are winning men. Because they believe this stuff. It's in your Bible. It's in mine. It's been in there for years. What else? In 2 Kings 6, verse 18, some men came to arrest Elisha. The servant woke up, freaked out, and Elisha said, chill, man. We have greater protection, as David said, than these guys. And he said, Father, first open the eyes of my servant. And he opened his eyes. What did he see? He saw angels and fiery chariots surrounding Elisha in the prophetic school so that's what they, what they were at. And then Elisha said, Lord, smite the enemies with blindness. And the enemies were smitten with blindness. Physical affliction 
and could not see. Elisha led them out of that area and he was not arrested. What else does the Bible say? If you look in 2 Samuel 23, verses 8 through 39, very interesting. Everyone has heard of Samson, how he slew a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass. But very few people talk about David's men in this chapter of 2 Samuel 23. And I'm going to skip around a bit because there are certain men that I particularly like and that I feel are very significant here. So 2 Kings, I mean, excuse me, 2 Samuel 23. I'm going to go down to the eighth verse. These are the names of David's famous soldiers. The first was Josbeb Bashab from Techaman. He was the leader of the three. He fought with his spear against 800 men and killed them all in one battle. What? Here's where martial arts comes in, in the scriptures and boxing in the scriptures in order for this man to kill 800 men with a spear at one time, he had to have some strategic moves and the power of the Holy Ghost was upon him the same way the power of the Holy Ghost gave Samson the strength, the might, the speed, the skill, the thinking, the flow, the rhythm, to kill a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass. This guy killed physically 800 men at one time. I'll let that sink in. Some of you are shocked. You think God is a punk. You think God wants you walking around letting somebody verbally abuse you and take advantage over you. That is not the case. Get that garbage out of your spirit Get it out of your head. Stand up like God called you to be. You got people, I'm going to hit it early. You got people walking around that murdered people like Trayvon Martin and others, women and men, black and Latino men, and got away with it. They're walking around unchallenged. I'll put it this way. They're walking around unchallenged by blacks and other Latinos. Yet when somebody in your neighborhood does something wrong, you're all up in their face. But you're silent when people that get away with murder and come into your neighborhood unrighteously and cause a ruckus, all you do is take out your phone and take a picture. That ain't what my Bible tells me. I'll move on. It says the second of the famous three was Elijah, son of Dodo of the clan of Eo. One day he and David challenged the Philistines who had gathered for battle. The Israelites fell back, but he stood his ground. He stood his ground. We need to keep standing our ground. And fought the Philistine until his hand was so cramped that he could not let go of his sword, meaning he had a death grip. And trust me, when he was swinging that sword, uh, he wasn't pulling it back. He worked so hard under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, he couldn't even let the sword go. And there's one more that I want to get to. Let's see. Verse 18. Joab's brother Abisha, their mother was Zariah, was the leader of the Famous 30, he fought with his spear against 300 men and killed them and became famous among the 30. So here we see the anointing of God upon this gentleman who slew 300 men at one time. I said the power of the Holy Ghost was upon him. There have been stories where a farmer Son has been trapped underneath a tractor. It doesn't even say the man prayed. The man went towards the tractor and lifted the tractor up and other people pulled that son out. The power of God came upon him. We're talking about the power of the Holy Ghost. And I'm giving you scripture. 
of how God thinks about someone verbally, psychologically, and physically harming you. What his word says, not of what you've been taught, that Eurocentric slave mentality, not what society has told you, I don't care what laws they pass, God's law is above any other. Peter said, I'd rather obey God than man. I'm giving it to you straight right here. What else do we see here? Esther chapter 8, verse 11, and Esther chapter 9, verse 5. When the Hebrews were being attacked, the king told them this. I'm going to go to Esther chapter 8. I want to read it exactly as it's stated because, men, it's time for us to walk in our authority. And I'm going to give you a real life example that just happened about a week ago. Uh, I'll give you the details later. But it happened about a week ago when someone did not walk in their authority and something happened that should not have happened. I personally know this because I personally know the individual. So we're going to go to Esther chapter 8 right now. And let's look at, as I get it here, chapter 8, verse 11. Okay, no, that's, that's Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Come on, Esther. But what happened is, Haman and his crew came against the Hebrews, and they sent people to tell the Hebrews what was going on and the king sent out what they call an edict or a decree that the Hebrews were to protect themselves as best they could until everyone was aware that the Jews or Hebrews called at that time were not to be taken advantage of physically. He basically told them, do what you have to do to protect yourself. And I'm reading scripture from to you that we as men should not allow other people to verbally violate us, to psychologically violate us, or even to physically violate us. I'll give you an example of a situation on a job as I find this scripture. Seems like it's hiding. But... I give you an example where uh, it was dealing with an interview. Someone went for an interview. They were a STEM professional and they had 15 years of experience. So, of course, in order to get into an interview, you have to go through the computer. Your resume is uploaded online. So as they enter into the interview, the ignorant interviewer wanted the professional to write it down physically. And the STEM professional said, I'll just end the interview here. See, that person walked in their authority and they left. Why should they, where is this scripture hiding? Why should they go through that and rewrite their, this is amazing, their uh, resume over again? Why should they do that? They shouldn't have to. Anyway, I'm not going to turn to the scripture. You can read it in Esther 8, chapter 11, and Esther chapter 9, verse 5. It talks about that king who says, do what you have to do to defend yourselves. Let's look at Peter and the sword in John chapter 18, verses 10 and 11. They had came to arrest Jesus, the Roman soldiers who were known to be ruthless. Peter pulls out his sword and tries to uh, actually chops the guy's ear off. Now, this is a physical attack of protection. And Jesus tells Peter, Pete, put your sword back in the case. And your Bible says sheath, same thing. Notice what Jesus did not say to Peter. He didn't say get rid of the sword. He said, Peter, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. He wasn't talking to Pete, specifically, personally to Peter. He was saying, Peter, the Romans are ruthless. They're going to reap what they sow. But he never told him to get rid of his sword. I'll move on. 
Now, in Isaiah chapter 37, you want to mark this down, verses 21, verses 36 to 38. Isaiah chapter 37, verse 21, and verses 36 to 38. Also write down Matthew 26 and 53. Matthew 26 and 53 is the same scenario of John 18, where Jesus tells his disciples and says this. Very interesting. If I want to, I can call 12 legion of angels and wipe these folks out. Notice what he said. Jesus said, if I want to. If I don't want to go to the cross and be the perfect sacrifice for mankind, I can call down 12 legion of angels from heaven and they'll wipe folk out. Because when these angels come, protective angels, they don't talk. They don't pray. They kill. That's what Isaiah 37, chapter 37, verse 21, and verses 36 to 38. Hezekiah was the king of Israel. The Assyrian king threatened him. God sent the prophet Isaiah like he's sending me a spokesman to talk to the men and told him basically, don't be afraid. He's a fool. I'm going to handle him. When the prophet left and the king of Assyria woke up, the king of Assyria saw 185,000 of his soldiers were dead. In other words, one angel, read it in your Bible, wiped out his whole army. He freaked out, ran to Romania, and his own sons killed him while he was worshiping a demon god. Oh, Brother Michael, in the New Testament, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's look at Acts chapter 12, verses 21 and 23. King Herod makes a speech. Someone in the audience says, it's not the voice of a man, it's the voice of a God. Your Bible, my Bible says, an angel of God smote Heroid right then he died and worms ate him up. That doesn't sound like a turn the other cheek God as we have been taught by the oppressive people to me. How about you? Read your Bible. It's in there. Acts chapter 12, verses 21 to 23. Paul in Acts chapter 13, verse 11. And that 13th chapter, he was ministering to a mayor. The mayor or governor of a city wanted to get saved. There was a warlock, Bar Jesus, a sorcerer, that tried to hinder that move. And Paul said, you enemy of God, you're trying to hinder this man from getting saved. I'm paraphrasing. He said, I speak blindness on you. That's a physical thing. Blindness upon him, and the man could not see for a season. So how come it's all right for a country or city or state to have a police force and units at the airport, security, and try to claim that it's wrong for a man to physically protect himself, his family, or even a stranger? You better do what you got to do. Now, I made a statement. I say this in love to this brother because I grew up with him in another church. And I made a statement that, uh, you know, I was joking that I wanted to smack somebody. And he said, well, you, you know, better not smack nobody because you might not live. Let me just go there. I'm going to jump, jump somewhere with this. Uh, number one, on the real side, I know who I serve. I believe this scripture, Psalms 144. God teaches my hands to war, for battle, my fingers to fight. He subdues nations under me. At the age of 15, I wasn't saved. We had stolen a car. Well, I didn't steal it. I was riding in it. Uh, we took Somebody took Tisdale's car, the guy that lived over by Hill House, nice Cadillac. We went up to West Rock, 
no, first we stopped at the pizza place that used to be uh, on Blake Street in that little corner. And there were some cops there. They spoke to us. We spoke to them. We got some slices of pizza, got in the car, went up to West Rock. So we seen these headlights behind us, and we thought they were just regular people. See more headlights come towards us. And you know, West Rock, there's one way in at that time, uh, and there was one way out. They cut it off now because people were killing folk up there and crazy stuff. But anyway, cops got out of the car and they were prejudiced. One cop in particular, I'll never forget. Why? Because I was sitting on the passenger side, the right hand side. He came to that side with that 32 snub nose, stuck it up against the window of the car right on the side of my face and said, don't move, boy. I'll never forget that. Remember, I wasn't saved. I was 15 at the time, but I felt the peace of God come over me. And God took all the fear away from me. Let me get closer to you in case you're listening, bro. I'm not trying to be bad and all that. I'm just letting you know I have confidence in the God that I serve. Because the brother Mike you saw working in the ministry, you didn't know all. But know this, I don't fear guys with guns. I didn't fear that racist cop. And I don't fear anyone else now. Second incident, when I lived in Westville, I was single. Hot summer night, couldn't sleep. I figured, well, let me get up and just take a walk. Walk down Whaley Avenue all the way down to Edgewood. Felt a nudge in my gut to sit down on one of those benches. You know, Edgewood went up over there. They got the grass with the benches. So I sit down. No more than five minutes that I sat down. <clears throat> I heard gunshots. You know, guys, KSI brothers over by Troop Edgewood at that time were really active. They still active, but they're not so much in the news now. Uh, one of the guy's mothers that started it used to go to our church. She was a us usher. I'm not going to mention no names, but um, on the real, I'm, I'm talking real here. I heard these gunshots, and again, I was not afraid. I sat on the bench like God told me to. I'm going to repeat it. I was not afraid. So what do you mean somebody's going to do something to me? No, they ain't. My God is a protector. And if you don't believe God to that level, brother, that's on you. Because I know who I serve. I know who I serve. He done proved himself. Once, twice, more than that. <laughs> so let me move on. I just wanted to get that in early. Because see, a lot of times people think because you read the Bible, men I'm talking about, and they read the Bible, you go to church, and they, re and, and they go to church, that you're the same when it comes to this. We ain't the same. Because if we were the same, you'd be given this message along with myself and others who I haven't heard anyone teach on it. But you're hearing me through the presence and power of God. Now take that to the bank and cash it in. We dealt with Acts chapter 13 verse 11. Paul speaking blindness on somebody. Let's go to Revelation 19 and 11. Remember David said, God teaching my hands to war and my fingers to fight. He subdues nations under me. What is he talking about? Total subduing of a nation means that people, you have to, you got to take people out to get full control of the economics and everything else because folk just ain't giving stuff up. And again, I'm appealing to the brothers, and especially the brothers in the neighborhoods, stop fighting amongst yourselves and letting racist people, I say it like this, go unchallenged when they do something in your neighborhood. You're quiet. You talk about it, but that's all you do. Revelation 19. Verse 11. Then I saw heaven open and there was a white horse. His rider is called Faithful and True. It is with justice that he judges and fights his battles. This is a physical war. His eyes were many crowns on his head. He had a name written on him, but no one except himself knows what it is. He robo, he was, his robe was covered with blood. It's called the word of God. The armies of heaven followed him on white horses. Out of his mouth, verse 15, came a sharp sword with which he will defeat 
the nations. He will rule over them with a rod of iron. He will trample out the wine in the winepress of the furious anger of the Almighty God. On his robe and on his thigh was written the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Here we see Jesus in Revelation 19 coming back physically destroying his enemies. Now we got God. We show God yesterday in the Old Testament. We showed him right now in the future. What does God think about the middle of this situation? If he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, he must have the same militant attitude right now. If he told the Jews in Esther 8 and 9 to do what they got to do to, to protect themselves, they're telling the men the same thing. Even law enforcement tells you that. They tell you what's legal to carry, what's not legal to carry. If you get caught carrying this, this is going to happen. But if you get caught carrying pepper spray, now you have to have a license for a shotgun. You have to have a license definitely for a handgun. If you have got a federal charge, you can't get it. But they're letting you know what's legal, what's not legal. You're a homeowner. Check your security system. I'm making it real. Watch your surroundings. Be aware of your surroundings. Train your kids to stay away from certain people in certain areas. Don't ride through certain areas at night. Do whatever you got to do to protect yourself so that you can walk in the authority that God told you to walk and all this foolishness will come to a halt. Of course we pray. Of course we speak the word. We've been doing that for years, but you better do something else. It's God, what God is saying, because it's in the Bible. I'm reading right here, Revelation 19. Jesus himself. Let's keep going, Revelation 19. I stopped about that 15 verse. I'm going to go down to verse 16, uh, 17. Then I saw an angel standing on the sun. He shouted in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair. Come and gather together for God's great feast. Come and eat the flesh of kings, generals, and soldiers, the flesh of horses, their riders, the flesh of all people, slave and free, great and small. In your Bible. Jesus has killed these people and the angel is telling the birds, come eat their flesh. We've been lied to for so many years. I, I'm not, I didn't tell nobody to go out and do this and do that. I'm telling you what the word says, how your mindset has been jacked up and how you need to get that slavistic attitude out of your mind so you can walk in the authority that you need to walk in. I'm going to give you a New Day example, New Testament Day example, just happened a week ago. Somebody I personally know did not walk in their authority, had a past incident with this individual. They wanted to jump all up in my face and blah, blah, blah. And I talked my way out of it. That's your first choice. If they were the through hands, I would have broke them down. I ain't hit nothing. And I'm not bragging. I'm being real. I'm going to break everything I hit. I've been working out over 30 years. I'm going to break everything I hit. Everything I hit, I'm going to break. I'm going to tear. See, I'm militant attitude. I believe that scripture about Samson. I believe it. The anointing of God, the Holy Ghost is in you. He's still going to work in whatever way he needs to. Back to this incident. He allowed his stepdaughter to come into his house, cuss him and his wife out, fuss them out. This happened for years. She went through them, going through their mail, leaving the house dirty, uh, her boyfriend's kids doing all kind of crazy stuff. He allowed that crap to happen and keep happening. He's on the job, gets a call from his wife. You need to come here. He walks in the house. Every picture on the wall is torn down. Brother got a beautiful home. This happened a week ago. He grabs the stepdaughter by the neck, calls the cops. They said, well, if we take one, we got to take the other. Plus, there was a door knocked down in his house. He got to spend thousands of dollars inside of his house. My wife and I told him earlier, don't let that girl disrespect you with her mouth. Small brat hussy. As Patty LaBelle would say, oh, heifer. 
They got a restraining order now. All because he did not walk in his authority. He's a believer, been saved over 10 years, teaches Bible study. I said he's a believer, been saved over 10 years, and teaches Bible study. Him and I had a disagreement. He huffing and puffing at me, but didn't do nothing about this stepdaughter until it reached this point. It didn't have to go to that point. If he would have listened to what my wife and I told him, put your foot down. And had the nerve to give the girl a key to his house. See, that's deception. His belief system was off. Hopefully now it's on. Anybody can make a mistake, but brother, you better take heed to this message today. So we use God's word. We try to walk and talk our way out, but there are other alternatives. Check your state for what's legal and what's not legal. And do whatever you got to do to walk in your authority. I'm talking to the unbeliever brothers now. And they already know. See, they got this. The unbeliever brothers got this. I know a gentleman right now, he's seeking God. If I mention his last name, you would know his relatives because they're very well known. But I won't because it's a private guy's school. This dude got a career in high executive security. He just uh, got a certificate for bodyguarding celebrities. And I mean, this brother <laughs> got security clearance up the yin yang. I mean, automatic this, that, uh, blah, 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 blah. I mean, he, he can get in the White House with the, with the certification he got. You don't have to go that far, but you better do something, man. Protect yourself. Be aware of your surroundings. Protect your family, your homeowner. Increase your lights, the lights around the house. Increase the motion detectors. Double check people. If you haven't uh, ordered anything that comes to your door, I don't care what kind of uniform they got on, always call that company and make sure. It's too much foolishness, foolishness going around. You know what I mean? So there was an incident, you know, that the young lady worked at a place and his mother came and there was a fuss between the mother and the person that runs the place and he's standing there and he tries to step up on the young lady, Spanish woman, very, very uh, uh, educated woman, very nice woman. I'm standing there. He tries to step on her. All I did was step over my head. I said, what? What's my point? My track record's proven. 2017, somebody tried to come off on me. Thought I was asleep. Spanish brother ate some brass knuckles. Yeah, I spent the weekend in jail, but I got my respect. Uh-huh. I said 2017. It's five years ago. I'm saved, filled with the Holy Ghost. Been filled with the Holy Ghost for over 30 years. You ain't taking advantage over me or nobody I know. My point is, I'm not trying to be something that I'm not. I'm not that Mikey Ellis in the 70s or the Mikey Ellis at Christian Outreach years ago. I'm walking in my authority. What about you? What are you doing to protect yourself? Are you working out? You swimming? You walking, jumping rope? What are you doing to heighten your sense of awareness? What books are you reading to d destroy the slave mentality? You need to listen to this video over and over. So, Father God, we thank you for victory in the mighty name of Jesus. Victory over the hands of the devil. For David said, you teach my hands to war, my fingers to fight. You want us safe. You want our children safe. You want our women safe. You want the elderly safe. All this home invasion and foolishness. Help us as men to stand up and be the light that you called us to be in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Enjoy your weekend. I'm going to enjoy mine. Bye-bye.